So we are going to look at the length of a curve. So we'll use the R of T function just like before. But now we're going to go from a closed interval A to B into, we'll go into R3, but this would work in any dimension. All we're going to do is take a magnitude. So it's important that it's closed because if you have an open interval, you could have infinite length. So if you have open interval, this curve could be infinitely long. So that's important right there that that is closed. Close should lead to finite length. So all we're going to do is take the derivative, which gives us the, uh, so we think of the way a curve looks between two t values. Our velocity is green, is that right? Blue. That was going to be my fourth guess. So I'm just drawing a bunch of little velocity arrows coming off of this. Velocity is blue? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to take the derivative to get the velocity vectors, and then we're going to find their magnitude, and then uh, integrate that. So integral from A to B, magnitude of R prime dt. So that's all there is to arc length right there. So find the derivative to get the velocity, and then take the magnitude and integrate. All right, are we going to get a number or a vector out of this? So right here, we're going to take a magnitude, so that will give us a number, and we'll be adding up a bunch of numbers. So this will give us a number, numerical distance that you travel along that curve. We can also. This R is just. Uh, R is our curve. Uh, so, just like before, R is the path that our particle takes, basically. So, we can use. If we want to use T as a variable endpoint. What we're going to do is reparameterize R of T with tau. Now, tau will be TAU. It looks very much like a pi with one leg. So it looks very much like a pi with just one little leg coming out of it. So we're going to use R of tau. We're just putting in T, uh, tau in place of T. And then length from T naught to T is equal to the integral T naught to T magnitude R dot. Now this is R of tau. D tau. So even though it's R of tau, we're still in here, we're still taking the derivative with respect to T. Respect to tau. Okay. That's why I put a prime there instead of a dot. Because I think when I wrote a dot, I always mean it with time. So it's R prime of tau. <coughs> All right, so that's a reparameterized version. It's very similar to the other one. You're just replacing your endpoint B with a variable. So it's really not, it's not really any different. So we're going to look at a definition of a smooth curve. So just a curve is smooth. All right, if I didn't tell you any more of the definition, what would be a reasonable definition for a smooth curve? Or what would be a curve that's not smooth? 
So we have some asymptotes. So if you think, let's think about traveling on a rocket ship or flying around. What would not be smooth? Stop. How about that right there? If you collide with something? All right, so let's look a little bit closer what's happening over here. I'll draw a slightly smaller curve. All right, so it has basically a corner. That's one way to think about it. This corner is where your velocity changes real quickly. So R of T is smooth if magnitude R prime T, that's the velocity, is not equal to zero for all T. Another way to think about this, R of T is never stationary. All right, if you know the magnitude is never zero, can the magnitude be negative? Can any magnitudes be negative? Not, uh, not if we're in the real numbers. So our, all of our magnitudes are positive. And if we think about that arc length function right above there, if we assume that this is always positive, always greater than zero, what that means is we're, we're gonna gain distance as t increases. So we're gonna keep moving along the curve as t increases. Any increasing function has an inverse. If you think about increasing functions, their value keeps going up, and so if you specify any output, you can know what input it came from. So if you had a problem centered at the origin, wouldn't that mean it's not smooth because it would equal zero? Parabola, well, when you say parabola, you're probably thinking y equals x squared. But we need to parameterize it. So if we parameterize it, I can go with x, or I should say t and t squared. So x is t, y is t squared. Right. And I could find r prime of t, which will be 1 comma 2t. That will never be 0. The magnitude will never be 0. Oh, right. So as a particle moves across this parabola, there is a point where it doesn't have any upwards portion of the uh, velocity, but that's very different than it. It's still moving, though. Right. All right. Does that make sense? Uh, and so a lot of the notions you have of derivative being zero, that's the old derivative where we we're looking at the slope of a line being zero. That's very different than the magnitude of your velocity being zero. So you can still travel around parabolas, circles, as long as you keep moving. Did that answer your question? Okay. So it's really all about the vector velocity now, not just one or two or three components of the velocity. It's about the velocity overall. So this means our parameterized arc length. Of a smooth R of T can be inverted. So we're going to let S of T going to be the arc length from T naught to T. We have to put a tau in here. So S of t is the arc length. Now, because we're integrating a function that's increasing, our integral will be one to one. And let's have 
in inverse. That's inverse of t. So what this inverse gives you, if you input a t value, that will correspond to a distance, it'll output the time it took to get to that distance. So it's a little bit strange, the original s function here inputs a time, outputs a distance. So I'll write that down, s originally inputs a time and outputs a distance. s inverse inputs a distance and then outputs the time it would take to reach that distance. And we're going to reparameterize the R function with S inverse. So this is going to be the curve R of T um, except it's going to be traversed at unit speed. So ready for an example? First example, find the arc length parameterization of R of T equals cos T, sine T, and T. So first thing we're going to do is find s of t, which is the integral from t naught to t, r prime tau, d tau. All right, I did not pick an initial time. What looks like a reasonable t value? Probably zero would be easy. Let t naught equal zero. All right, so find s of t. So you take derivative, then take the magnitude and integrate it from zero to t. So I'll just plug in tau first. Doesn't do anything except switches everything into tau. So any questions on the square root two T Yep. What's unit speed? What's that? Unit speed. What is it? Yeah, what's so we're about to find out. Well unit means one. So unit speed will be speed of one. <clears throat> Alright, so we got S of T right here. This uh, magnitude of r prime worked out really well to be a constant. 
so it was super easy. Sine squared plus cos squared is one. That's the it should have been pretty obvious that simplification, but that squ sine squared plus cos squared is one plus one. That's two right there. And that integral is super easy. It's constant, so it'll be squared to two tau. Plug in t, plug in zero, subtract, and there we go. All right, so I got s of t. How do we get the inverse of s of t? There's two steps. So we're going to have to switch x and y. There is no x and y. So I'm going to let y equal square root 2 t. And then we're going to switch y and t. We're going to find S inverse, yeah. Is it of tau or of t? Uh, tau disappeared when we finished integrating. That was what we call a dummy variable up there. I could use any variable instead of tau. Just the book uses tau just because it looks like a t, basically. Is there a reason you have to switch from t to tau? Uh, if you don't switch, you'll have a t and a t, uh. and it will be ambiguous. Now you could use a different font or a different color pen or something like this, but I recommend you change one of those two variables. All right, so swap y and t. So we have t equals square root two y, solve for y. So one over square root two t equals y, and this is s inverse of t. Now this should make sense because the original function s took t and multiplied by square root two, so this unmultiplies t by square root two. So it undoes what the s function did. So now we're gonna reparameterize. R of s inverse of t. So that's r of 1 over square root 2 t. My original r function, don't plug into r prime. We want to plug into the original r, which is at the top of the screen. So it's cosine tau, or cos t, wherever we're at, cos t sine t t. So it's now cosine t over square root 2, comma, sine t over square root 2 comma t over square root 2. So this is the reparameterized version. Now, I mentioned this has unit speed. How can we test that out? How do we get the speed? If this is position, Derivative first, magnitude second. Now if you take the magnitude first, you'll get your distance from the origin. And then if you take the derivative, you'll see how that distance changed. So that's very different than you want to know how fast the particle is moving. So the order of these operations is super important. So we're going to take derivative and then magnitude. So we're taking the t derivative. and magnitude at the end. So that's how it looks. Derivative inside, magnitude afterwards. You could put an extra parentheses. I'll do it with green, just so you're 100% sure you're doing your derivative before your magnitude. What rule do I have to use here? Chain rule. So you're going to have to use the chain rule here.
So any computation questions of what's on the board? All right, so we got unit speed. I'm going to use the chain rule in a different way on the right side. So I'm gonna make sure there's no questions before I zoom in a little more on the right side. All right, so first of all, the chain rule is gonna look like R prime of regular S of T times Oops, S inverse of T times, oh, this is the worst notation, S inverse prime of T. Ugh. All right. <laughs> so this is what the chain rule looks like. What multiplication is happening between these two terms here? So on the left side, R prime, is that vector or a number? Vector. What kind of outputs does the S or S inverse function give us? Numbers. So this is a scalar uh, times a vector. So it's just a regular scalar multiplication. All right, we got S inverse of T right here at the top of the screen. What's the derivative of S inverse of T? One over square root two. Derivative of S inverse. R prime is already written up there somewhere. There it is, R prime, the upper left right there. R prime of tau, all I'm gonna do is replace tau right here with S inverse of T, which is somewhere one over square root two T. So I'm just replacing what I have circled with one over square root two t. Well, I'll write that out one more time. So it'll be r prime of one over square root two t times, I already said s inverse prime of t is one over square root two. All right, so that r prime we had at the top of the board. So it's negative sine of the input comma cosine of the input. So negative sine one over square root two t cos one over square root two t comma one. That was just r prime of tau, the top of the board there. I just replaced the taus that I circled with the proper input. So this is function composition we're looking at right here. It's a little bit tricky when you're in multiple dimensions. So put a little arrow where I used it. Uh, what I left off is all the absolute, or the magnitudes. So we're about to take a magnitude here. So we take a magnitude of this. I can break the scalar outside. And I have sine squared plus co squared plus one squared square root. So that'll all be one plus one multiply by one over square root two. Square root two times one over square root two, which gives us one again. So you have multiple ways of computing with the chain rule. So on the right side, I did the chain rule where I bring, brought the scalar product outside, and then the left side, I just did everything, all the computations first, and then calculus second. So that was probably confusing because that was the first derivative you went either way on the chain rule. But hopefully that'll start making more sense. So we can look at the unit tangent vector.
So this will be capital T, and it's going to be V over magnitude V. And V is derivative of R, so you could write it as R dot over magnitude of R dot. So that's a unit tangent vector. Speed. So, so this is a unit tangent vector. Now, why do they use capital T for the unit tangent vector? I don't know, but the unit tangent vector uses capital T. If the word unit wasn't there, it would just be R dot. It will give you the direction lines going, but not how, not the magnitude, so not how fast you'd be going around the curve at that point. Now, why does this require a smooth curve? What would be messed up? What would go wrong if I didn't have a smooth curve here? Divided by zero. I'd be divided by zero. So there's going to be a whole lot of times where we're going to divide by the magnitude. And if the magnitude's over zero, we're going to run into problems. So to make sure your curve is smooth, which for us means it's not stopping. Uh, and our speed is just magnitude of V or magnitude R dot. So that's tangent vector and unit tangent vector and speed. So our last example. Find u tangent vector. And length traveled for t between 0 and 3, where r of t equals 2 plus t, negative t plus 1, comma, t. So find unit tangent first. So there's r. So first thing, find r dot of t. It's still going to be a vector in r3. And then I'll scroll up so you can have the tangent vector up there. The right hand point is a bracket, right? Yeah, that's a really bad bracket. And you're also going to need the magnitude of the r dot. My plus sign doesn't look like a T. My plus signs are not. That's probably my worst plus sign right there. I'll give you that. <laughs> that one right there. There we go.
bit to the speed. The Oh yeah, I want to score it three. Absolutely. So that one's not? So if you go to the left, that one, because you have r dot over oh. magnitude of r dot. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, what I just wrote down is nothing in particular. So yeah, I should be using 1, negative 1, 1. There we go. That always had magnitude of 1. All right. All right, so that is basically all there is at 13.3. And computations are, they're not easy, but they're all very similar when you do them. You just have to take the magnitude or derivative at the right point, either before or after the other one. Sometimes you're dividing by the magnitudes, so you just have to pay attention to what you're doing. And the order is super important. So the next topic we're gonna look at is curvature.